Jayam Bishnupad Paramahansa Padi Bajikacharya Sutta Chitra Langu Sabai Chadun Bhukti Vedanta Sai Mara Shila Prabhupada Ki Yiskan BBT Founder Char Jagu Guru Shila Prabhupada Ki Ananta Guravai Shabindu Ki Nam Char Shalhar Das Thakur Ki Prem Shuho Shukishan Chaitana Prabhu Nityananda Shidweta Gadada Shiva Sadi Guru Bhakti Vrindu Ki Sisi Radhikishan Guru Gupinat Shama Kunda Radha Kunda Kiri Govardhan Ki Vrindabhadam Ki Matura Dham Ki, Dukka Dham Ki, Navadi Dham Ki, Jagannapuri Dham Ki, Jamuna Mai Ki, Ganga Mai Ki, Tulsi Mahadani Ki, Bhakti Devi Ki, Sambhira Bhakti Vindu Ki, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Sri Sri Rukmini Dukka Disha Ki, Sri Krishna San Kirtana Jaga Ki, Goprema Nandi. All glories to the Samo Devotees. All glories to the Samo Devotees. All glories to the Samo Devotees. All glories to the Divine Lotus Seat to C.C. Guru and Gauranga. Namo Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tanamani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pacharani Nirvasesha Sunyavadi Paskachade Satarani Shri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nityananda Shidweta Gadada Shivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Hari Ram, Hari Ram, 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 Hari, Hari. So we're going to deal today with some history. And don't worry, we'll bring it around to, hopefully, to some solid philosophical and devotional points. But Dhananjaya Prabhu, Prabhupada's Dhananjaya, formerly, if you know, Vrindavan and the guest house and so many things. He's one of the early devotees in um, Bhaktivedanta Manor. And he told me one time that uh, Prabhupada's servant was sick and he was a young brahmachari, probably been living in the temple month, two months, something like that. And Prabhupada you know, took his massage every day and his regular devotee to do that was not able to do it and he'd noticed Dhananjaya. So he told Mukunda, because Dhananjaya in those days was a strong brahmachari. He called Dhananjaya over. Uh, he had Mukunda call him over and said, I want you to massage because we need a replacement. Dhananjaya had never massaged anyone in his life. He was completely nervous. He walked in, Prabhupada picked up his accent because Prabhupada went to Scottish Church's college and he's from Scotland, Dhananjaya. And so Prabhupada asked him, uh, oh, are you from Scotland? He said, yes. So Prabhupada said, I know some Scottish lords. And Prabhupada began the whole history of the Scottish, you know, kings and this and that and laid out the... Actually, Dhananjaya realized later on it was Prabhupada just relaxing him so he could actually give Prabhupada a nice massage, you know. But Prabhupada knew a lot of history and he would pull it out sometimes at the appropriate times. So we can learn, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, that the material world is a dictionary for the spirit. We can read it, we can learn from it, see how it's operating. So don't worry. We're going to bring it around to a, I hope that you'll be satisfied. But it's good to know our tradition, to know our history and know our, that we don't, this is not new age, this is not sentiment, this is not emotion, this is not wishful thinking. It is factual history. Prabhupada said the Mahabharata is the history of the world. So it's history. Okay, so back to the main thing. You all know this somehow or other, just out of curiosity. See this red dot? What happens? It's interesting, isn't it? Are we voidists? Anyway, so we're not going to leave that. But you can see what's going on. Um, the story, of course, is, and even now in India, the different vendors, everybody doesn't go to Amazon or go to the mall, you have vendors who walk down the street, you got the guy selling milk and he's calling out whatever, he's going to get some of the vegetables they're calling out and they're carrying their baskets or they have their rickshaw full of whatever. Just like, I mean, you still find you're at a train, chai, chai, you know, they're calling out what their, what their wares are. So the fruit vendors go and call out their particular call and, not, and little baby Krishna had seen his mother or father go out with some grains, barter and get some fruit. So the pastime is, he goes out, baby Krishna, Bal Gopal, goes out with some grains falling through his fingers to barter to get some fruit. And he's so charming 
that she's automatically, although he didn't give her the material exchange rate, just so charmed she's loading his arms with nice first-class mangoes. But you notice what Krishna's looking at is her basket, and because of her pure devotion and pure surrender, her whole basket of fruit was turned into jewels. The point being is that the secret is samsidhi haritoshanam, the secret of success in our individual lives or in society at large is are we pleasing the Supreme Lord? To the degree that we please the Supreme Lord, Lord, uh, everything becomes auspicious and successful. So that's the theme to get us starting. Now, who's our, if I say next, you're the man? Thank you, next. Thank you, for, so far so good, Prabhu. So this is a quote from the first canto, Queen Kunti's Prayers. All these cities and villages are flourishing in all respects because the herbs and grains are in abundance. The trees are full of fruits. The rivers are flowing. The hills are full of minerals and the oceans are full of wealth. And this is all due to your glancing over them. So this is Queen Kunti's prayers. You've got the theme that again, everything becomes, they put, you know the saying, the cart before the horse? We don't have time for spiritual life we're busy trying to push matter around and make everything opulent, comfortable, and it doesn't work that way. If you please Krishna, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all things shall be added unto you, as it says in the Bible. If we surrender to Krishna and please Krishna, everything flows. And if you ignore Krishna, what is it? Uh, uh, all things rest to me on pearls on mother. What is it? No, no. Shute mani gana eva is the last line. But the point is that all things rest on me like pearls on a thread. You pull out that thread, what do you have? So that's where we're going here. You'll see. Now, hey, how are you, Christian, to you? Um, none from Prabhupada's purport. The natural gifts, such as grains and vegetables, fruits and rivers, hills full of jewels and minerals, and the seas full of pearls, are supplied by the order of the Supreme. And as he desires, material nature produces them in abundance, or restricts them at times. The natural law is that the human being may, may take advantage of these godly gifts by nature and satisfactorily flourish on them. Prabhupada's famous state statement, you cannot eat nuts and bolts. That actually everything depends on the mercy of Krishna, it depends on rain, and then comes grains, and then everything flows. Next. So from one grain of rice, we can understand the whole pot. This is Prabhupada's example. So the point is, I'm going to talk about the colonization of India. The, what, what happened? If we read about the opulence, we were just reading about the glory of Vedic India, the opulence. What happened? Where did that all go? And devotees go to India or hear the history and look around and think, well, geez. Are the, are, are the narrations of the Bhagavatam wishful thinking? Are they exaggerations? Are they poetic artistry? But I was saying early, this is history. Well, how do you square what we're looking at now and what you, what's in the Bhagavatam and how does that all work out? So also there's been a cultural trend, the, like water flows in a particular direction. As Kali Yuga progresses, what happens to the culture and the world view? So we're going to start off looking at, at, at a little slice of the colonization, the, what the British did to India. And you'll see why in a second. And from, from that case study, we can understand what's happened as Kali Yuga progressed around the world. Okay, that's where we're going. Hey, that was good, thanks. India's gross national product in 1500. You know, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So let's start. It's a good place to start. Fifth, it's you know, 1500. Because, you, you know, in the West, we're advanced, and you've got the great empires. You've got England, you've got Spain, you've got France. You've, even the Dutch were in there for a while, you know. But the actual fact is, India's gross national product in 1500 was estimated at $100 billion a year. Now, by comparison, France was a distinct 18 billion. What is that? It's one-fifth of what was happening in India. And 
Next to them was, Fran was Italy and Germany. England was only $12 billion compared to $100 billion. So when Prabhupada describes the opulence of the, you know, the villages, well, you'll, we'll see in a second, but there were spices, jewels, cloth, real opulence. You know? Prabhupada said modern opulence, when India was first getting its liberation, you know, independence, so-called independence, and they were bragging, bragging how we're becoming advanced, Prabhupada said, you are simply making sewing machines and bicycles. So next. So here's our friend Christopher Columbus and everyone else. Where were they trying to go? Christopher Columbus. Why did it matter that the world was round and you could sail west? Because what would happen? You go to India. Why? These are all the different trade routes. You had Vasco da Gama, you had Magellan, you had all these, you know, when you're a kid in history, you read all these people. Where were they all trying to get? They were all trying to get the fastest route to overland routes around Africa, There's so many different things, because of the wealth of India. They were freezing there in Europe, dying of bubonic plagues, thought that, you know, showers made you sick. India was advanced culture, the remnants of the Vedic tradition, the opulence of Vedic India. Next. This is from a quote. This is the Portuguese ambassador, Vijayanagar. You know the, um, you've seen that big stone statue of Lord Nishringadev on the hill, the big, big, he's got, his, he's got the legs crossed and he's, isn't that famous? That's Hampi. That's the capital of Vijayanagar, which was around the same time. Here it is, 1520. This is the, he, it's not that these cultures didn't know each other. They had it the, from China, they were coming from India, from France, they were coming to India, the, the Persian Empire, they were all Turkish Empire. They were all sending ambassadors and knew about each other, communicating, and they were all trying to get the wealth of India. So the people in this, here is the Portuguese ambassador to Vijayanagar, where that beautiful Lord Nishingadev deity is in South India. Um, Here's what he said. Uh, the people in this city are countless, so much so that I do not wish to write it down for fear it will be thought to be fabulous. Imagination. What I saw seemed as large as Rome and, er and very beautiful to the sight. There were many groves of fruit trees within it. There were many conduits of water and places where, and places there are lakes. The city is the best provided city in the world. When they were fight following Vedic culture, it works. Here's tangible results. Next. Now this is from a Persian merchant writing in his notes. And there's so many quotes, I just picked up a few. I saw that it was a city of enormous magnitude and population with a king of perfect rule, leadership, and dominance. You can still go there. And they've restored the throne room of, of the king of Vijayanagar. Krishna's the 13th or whatever. Krishna Dev Rai, there we go, my friend. Independent confirmation. And you can see engraved in the stone above his throne room are the verses in Bhagavad Gita, all the qualities of a Kshatriya. So that, you know, charitable, brave, all that doesn't run from a fight, so many things. So when you sit there, the king was sitting on the throne and looked out thinking I'm the king and they're fanning me. He saw around him the verses from Krishna. Oh, you think you're a Kshatriya? Here's the measure. You have to come up to these qualities. So we'll read on. Um, a king of perfect rule, leadership, and dominance. His regents were flourishing and he possessed around 300 ports. He had a thousand elephants with bodies like mountains. The city of Vijayanagar has no equal in the world. This gives you a taste of when they were actually following Vedic culture, the opulence that therefore flowed. Next. This is just to give you a sample. This is the main gate of Red Fort. Uh, you know, you can see it. You can go there in Delhi. This is the Red Fort in Delhi. You could drop, this is just the gate getting into the thing. You could drop Buckingham Palace in a corner and they'd use it as a horse stable. That's the opulence. Next. Now, John Rowe, this is the first British ambassador to India. He brought the topmost award, 
that you can get from the British government to a non-British citizen. It's the, or, the order of such and such, you know. And it's a fancy metal. Now those things are gold-plated and cloisonné, which is baked enamel. And they gave it to him. Now, the king, the, the, the Mughal emperor at that time, was just dripping with jewels, diamonds. The, the, the crown jewels of England were all stolen from deities in India. The prophet said, therefore, the British lion is badly bandaged, the karmic reaction of all that. But my point is, when they offered him, not the, the, the king of Vijayanagara, I'm sorry, when they offered him this top, because they were trying to get ports, they wouldn't even let him into the kingdom. All over India. They got little things. They got Panchadari for the French. There was Goa for the Portuguese. There was Calcutta for the British. They gave him a little toehold, toehold port where all the opulence of India could, could flow out. And then whatever they wanted from the West could flow in. But they wouldn't let him inside the interior of the country because with all their bad habits and nasty behavior, they wouldn't even let him in. Just like we wouldn't let some nasty person, all right, fine, we'd give him a little plate of prashadam and say, you know, take a shower and then come back. So they offered him this medal. Top honor that you can give to a non-British citizen. He looked at it, the man's dripping with jewels, looked at this little thing, gold plate, said, give it to my horse. When they would go on parade, his horse would wear it. I mean, you can imagine how tweaked the Brits were by that. You know, the, the, so, this is the, and they, that's all they were trying to do, just get a toehold to get a little bit of the riches of India. Next. So what happened? I mean, you go to India now, and it's chaos personified. And of course, now it's coming back a little bit. But, so what happened? Because people ask us that. If your philosophy, if your culture is so wonderful, then what happened to India? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, where's the practical application? I'm showing you the remnants of a practical application of Vedic India. But the question becomes, what happened? Next. And you'll see where we're going. Now, this is Lord Macaulay, 1835. He was sent. The British were gradually... T you know how Prabhupada says, he gives the example, if, if, if you're riding on a... If you're sitting on a bus seat or a train seat in India... And the train is completely packed. Someone will say to you, can I, can I sit on the edge? Just, can I look? It's okay, fine, you're a nice person. You get a little bit of an edge to sit on the bench. What do they do? They lean on you. Hey, you move over a little bit. They lean on you, move over a little bit. And after a while, probably, so they push you right off the seat and they got the whole seat. So that, they got these little seaports and they gradually, they, they played the different princes. It was a whole insidious chess game. But gradually they started taking over more and more of India. So they wanted the whole thing. At this point they wanted the whole thing. This is, this is history. You can Google it. Um, Lord Macaulay addressed to the British Parliament February 2nd, 1835. He was sent by the British government, working with the East India Company, which was a commercial company, later on it became nationalized, and they took over India. But they said, how do we get control of this place? Lord Macaulay, just read, this is what he said to the British Parliament. This is the sawing under the structure of Vedic culture. This is how India went to hell in a handbasket. It wasn't by accident. I have traveled across the length and breadth of India and I have not seen one person who was a beggar. Now you have to picture, this is the time of Dickens, you know, Scrooge, or you know, the, the best of times, the worst of times, you know, horrible poverty in the streets, horrible disease, exploitation. That was British England. Here he says, you know, I have not seen one person who was a beggar, who was a thief, such wealth I have seen in this country, such a high moral values, people of such caliber, that I do not think, note this, we could ever conquer this country unless, that's why I called it an insidious, insidious is uh, uh, duplicitous, conniving, be underhanded. So, um, I do not think we could ever conquer this country unless we break the very backbone of this nation, which is 
her spiritual and cultural heritage. This is a public document. He's speaking to the British Parliament. Therefore, I propose that we replace her old and ancient educational system, her culture. For if the Indians think that all that is foreign and English is good and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, their native culture, and they will become what we want, a truly dominated nation. Do you understand what they're saying? This is how we're going to undermine this entire country and turn them into work units, into slaves. A truly do dominated nation. Next. And he's just to confirm, this is from the, from the records, there's a picture of Lord Macaulay there. He's probably a dog in the Swedish embassy now. Next. This idea of citizens, the king of Kashmir, in those days, he was a strict king. This is the 1850s. He had a big tower built in his capital city, Srinagar. I don't know what the name, I forget what it is. He had a big tower built. And someone's assignment every morning when the sun came up with a telescope searched the whole city and made sure that there was some smoke coming up from every house. Why was there smoke coming up? It means they're cooking. It means that they're healthy. It means they've got supplies and they're eating their meals. And after searching the whole skyline and making sure there was, wherever there wasn't smoke coming up, they'd send someone. Do you need money? Do you, are you in bad health? Do you need a doctor? Do you need some supplies? What do you, you know, how are you doing? When the king got a report back that, okay, everyone in the kingdom is eating, in the city is eating, then only would he eat his meals. That's a Vedic king. Everyone's fed. They're all prajas. They're all dependent on me. I'm like their father, giving them protection. So, but this is a whole switch, and this is Kali Yuga. You know the story about the, the, the camel getting his nose under the edge of the tent? First you get, he's got the nose, and eventually you get the whole camel in your tent, and it takes everything over. That's what Kali Yuga does. It takes over. And this seeing the citizens as work units to be exploited, we'll get into it more. You'll understand where I'm going here. This is the typical thing that Indians did not drink tea. Why? It's an intoxication. It ruins your teeth, spoils your digestion. It's a, it, that, why do we want to mess with this stuff? So the Brits, seeing, you know, we got all these people here. We're shipping it all off to England. We've got a whole free marketer. Let's get them drinking tea. And they had pretty girls on the, tree, on, on the train station platforms with f nice Indian chai. A little milk, you know, some spices, and oh, it's good for your health, it's good for your digestion. And they distributed it for free. You know, Indians, best and cheapest, hey, it's free, oh, down the hatch. That tastes good. Get a caffeine rush out of the thing. And after they got them all addicted to it, then no more free tea, you got to buy it. And that's what's happening throughout our culture. We'll give you some other examples. It appears... When they put a television, I remember when color TV first came out. I'm 70 years old. And I remember saying to my father, this is great. Disney, what was it, Disney World and cartoons and, jeez, they're given to us for free? My father said, it's not free. He said, this is the one-eyed idiot. It's the one-eyed bandit. Because what comes along with the free television? You're darn right. Oh, you don't have a whiz-bang, whatever, or you don't have this, or your neighbor's got a new car, well, how you, you know, planned, op, planned obsolescion, and the whole, th they plant all those seeds in your head. And before you know it, you're like a fish on a hook, being reeled in. It's not free at all. It's simply, you're opening your door, the one-eyed bandit, oh, come on in, and steal everything from me. So, okay, next. Um, they got them addicted to, to opium. The Brit this is the British, here what it says here. Uh, this is weighing opium at a government factory in India. There's your British guy with a, you know, his pit helmet and everything. Got the people addicted to opium. Got them addicted to smoking cigarettes. Got them addicted to tea. Next. In it, the Indian ships, this is history, sailed into the London Harbor laden with Indian goods. The British government was shocked. They had, they had as large a merchant marine you know, shipping, commercial ships 
as the, as the British Empire. And they sailed up the Thames to London and started selling their wares. Cut the Brits out of it completely. They were shocked. What did they do? Seeing the potential competition, they systematically destroyed India's shipbuilding industry by not allowing ships over a certain small size to be used by Indian businesses. If you wanted to ship to England, you had to use a British shipping company. The only size that they let little, you know, so you could go from port to port, coastal boats. That's all you could build in India. You could not build a seafaring by law of the British government. Next. The Brits broke the Indian sweep. You know Gandhi. What's on the Indian flag? What is the symbol on the Indian flag? Chakra, yeah, but, it, but it's originally it was something else. It stands for something. Huh? No, it stands for the spinning wheel. It, I, it did work with me, my friend. It stands for the, why was Gandhi spinning cloth? He had nothing to do. He wanted to knit a sweater. He'd learned from his grandmother. Because the whole point was independence and village life. That you make your own cloth, you make your... Prophet said you have some land, you have a cow, the great weather of India, you're fine. Too much, Prophet says right in the Bhagavatam, too much dependence on others kills the very vitality of the self. Now everybody's dependent on everybody else, everybody's got to go to the mall, the Amazon goes down and everybody goes into therapy. They're going to starve. They, you know... Anyway, we can get into it, but the because I don't want to spend too much time. But the, just try to understand the British and people were doing this all over the world. We'll get to it. We'll, we'll modernize it. Don't worry. Um, the British broke the India weaving industry. You saw in that people traveled from all over the world. Well, here it says the, the raw all rotten cot all raw cotton was exported to England to Manchester and then shipped back to India as mill cloth. You, India had its own cloth industry, one of the best in the world. And the Brits, little by little, no, 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 you ship it all to England, their mills turn it into mill cloth, and then you have to go back to India, they ship it back to India, and you have to buy, the, the, the Indians had to buy it at a higher cost. They sucked the natural resources out of India, turned it into milk cloth, shipped it back to India, and charged them again for milk cloth. So Gandhi's whole thing was, no, 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 we're going to set up our own looms, we're going to depend on our own village life, we're going to go back to our traditional culture where people were free and happy. Okay, thus the British killed off what had been one of the largest and best quality hand loom cotton industries in the world. Next. Just where would you want to be? Here's an Indian weaver. And here are the mills in Manchester. What do you think brings out the finer sentiments of the human being? The doors open, fresh air. There's a sense of accomplishment. There's a sense of uh, artistry, of aesthetics, of developing the finer sentiments of the human being to, pro to produce quality. You go to Chicago, you go to New York, you go to those old, and you see those stone buildings, those crafters, from, you know, from Eastern Europe and, and from I Italy. And those are beautiful buildings. Now what do you get? Everything's stainless steel and, you know, square like a box. So, and what does that do? I was distributing books in Detroit one time. There's a place called the River Rouge Stamping Factory. It's the Ford Motor Company. It's the largest factory in the world. You go there at night. Providence Factory is another name for hell. And you see all the smoke and bad smells and flames from the open furnaces. When you go to Toledo, when you go out of Detroit over Toledo, you go right past the River Rouge Stamping Factory. And across from the factory, I swear to you, right across the street, what do you see? Bars, you know, cheap loans, prostitutes. It's all right across the street. The poor, simple guy working in Hamtramck, Pollock, in the, you know, in the, in the Unirail tire factory, stumbles out and all of his money is just sucked out completely, gambling, drinking, prostitutes. It's another name for hell. I met a guy one time uh, and I, I said, what do you do? He said, I work at the River Rouge stamping factory, Ford Motor. 
I say, what do you make? He said, I don't know. He said, I put the sheet of metal in, I pull the lever, wham! It comes out, it's all bent to hell. That's literally what he told me. I said, how long have you been working there? 18 years. Can you imagine what that does to you? Five days a week, eight hours a day, bam, bam, bam. What does that do to your brain? And you just have to go out and drink and gamble and have a prostitute and just dull your brain. That's not human life. That's not civilization. That's not advancement. Prophet said, your advancement is like the moth into the flames. So that's India as a case study of what happened to the glorious Vedic culture and how it becomes diluted and, and dissuaded and diverted. Okay, next. Now, well, there it says it. This is Aurobindo. Oh, yes, I'm offending Aurobindo. Well, hold on a minute. He's considered, you know, one of the big sages. Oh, you've got, you know, well, I'll just say it. Ram Krishna, and you've got so many of these guys, you know, Tagore. Who said, anyway, I don't want to get started. But Sri Aurobindo, even when I first went to India in 1973, there was a huge billboard. I mean, as big as this building, as you came out of the Calcutta airport on the road to Mayapur. There was that roundabout, and then you went on the road to Mayapur. And it said, with a picture of sage looking Aurobindo, we do not belong to the dusks of the past but to the dawns of the future. What does that mean? What is the subliminal message there? We do not belong to the dusks of the past, the setting darkness of our primitive forebears. But where are we marching towards? The bright dawn of the future. Turns out he was paid by the British to teach karma yoga because they couldn't fire up the Indian community to get out there and get into constant, you know. The only person who had a big building was the deity had a beautiful temple and the king had a beautiful palace. The king had to have a palace to emanate Ishwar above so people would follow him and understand the power of the king. But everybody else lived in a simple cottage. They all had a compound. You have a, you have a little simple cottage, clean and neat, you know. I saw a figure the other day, it's coming out from Oxford University, the diseases that modern houses breed, all the strange microbes and horrible things. Yeah, I mean, it is spooky. Carcinogen, I mean, just these little prefab things that people, probably says pigeonholes in the skyscraper buildings. If you get a backyard, oh, you're opulent. Every house in India, in the village, has a little yard in front. You keep your cows. You got some, you know, you do some gardening over here. You sit out there on your, in, the, in, the, in the morning sun. Get some fresh air. Okay. So he was paid by the British to teach karma yoga. Work hard to make India into an industrial state. And Nehru was, I'm, who else am I going to offend? Nehru was full bore into it. Forget the past. Forget what Gandhi said. Forget simple village life. Get out there and work like a dog and we'll build the nation. But what direction are you going in? What, what caliber of people are you developing? Radhanath Maharaj, who speaks at far out places, spoke to the directors of the Bank of England. This was in London, obviously, the Bank of England and all their different branch directors. And he said, you're so proud. Talk about truth to power. They loved it too, truth to power. So he said, you're so proud. Uh, you measure the success of it. They have the G7, they have the G20. Those were the top industrial nations and they measure by gross national product. Gross national product means durable goods. Durable goods means that which lasts longer than three years. How many airplanes, how many washing machines, how many televisions, how many computer screens are you pumping out? And that's how they rate, it's called gross national product. And that's how they recognize an advanced nation. Radhanath Maharaj, speaking to the directors of the Bank of England, gross national product, look at your social metrics. Look at your suicide, look at your divorce rate, look at your um, uh, drug addiction, look at, look at your suicide rate, look at, you just, you just zip, go right down the line. Is that, are those the symptoms of a healthy society? Gross national product, look at the result. He said, what you need to measure 
is gross national happiness. Instead of GDP, we want GNH, gross national happiness. That's how you measure a society. And it's completely true. Okay, so that's where we're going here. Next. Prabhupada's purport. Now, you have to realize, Prabhupada wrote, this is in the first Canto Bhagavatam, so he's writing in like 1965. Somebody do the math. 35 plus 22, 57, over a half century ago. Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavatam, and look at our world today. The gigantic industri industrial enterprises are products of a godless civilization, and they cause the destruction of the noble aims of life. Whoosh, bang, whoosh, bang. All bent to hell. I don't know. No sense of pride in one's work and accomplishment and aesthetic and to, deal, to produce something of quality. Forget it. Um, the more we go on increasing such troublesome industries to squeeze out the vital energy of the human being, the more there will be unrest, dissatisfaction in the people in general, although a few only can live lavishly by exploitation. That's the world. This, the current generation is the first generation in America that's going to have a lower standard of life than their parents. I mean, let that soak in for a minute. The American dream is that every, you know, we're building to the future. We're building to the future. I have a better house. I have a better car. I, have, you know, I can retire earlier. That was the American dream. It no longer exists, my friends. It is gone. As David Ritamar says, you know, what they, you know why they call it the American dream? You have to be asleep to believe it. It's the first people have to stay at home longer. They're putting off getting married. The whole demographics of you know, childbirth, and that, that's completely screwed up. They're all in debt with constant anxiety. Oh, what happened? Go back for a second. Um, so I just want to finish this. So, well, okay, fine, go ahead. You got the picture, I hope. Okay, next, sorry, Prabhu. Now, just for fun, this is Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He's meeting with the, this is the British governor for Bengal. It was the second post in the British Empire, you know, in India. Un right under the viceroy was Bengal, because Bengal was the most opulent. Bengal in 1935 had a higher gross national product than the entire country of France. So, well, I'll just tell, the, I don't know where we are for time. Oh, geez. Shilabhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur asked this British governor of Bengal to come to Mayapur for the festival, for a Gorpurnim. He was roundly criticized by other Gaudiya Mats and other followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Why are you inviting this materialistic meat eater out to Mayapur? Why? Now the thing is that there weren't many pilgrims coming out to Mayapur because all there was was an ox-drawn cart, you know, trail. That's all there was, a groove trail. So, you know, and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, with his deep compassion, was thinking people can't come and have darshan of Navadvip Dham, of Mayapur. They can't come to the birthplace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he devised a plan, because when he invited the governor, the governor, he's not going to come out in this funky, bumpy old road. The British military spent three months and completely restructured, you know, what do you call it, uh, improved the road from Calcutta to Mayapur. Later on, you know, and they were all criticizing why by this meat eater. Srila Bhakti, uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, the governor was scratch, which is worthless. He said, I wanted the road. That's what, and he got a great road built by the British Empire, you know, by the British uh, military. So, his, this, this is a postcard that you used to be able to buy at the Gaudiya Mat, the Chaitanya Mat. And it's a picture of, this is a radio coil. He's making an announcement to the, to the nation on, British, on BBC. You know what the name of his lecture was? He's sitting next to the British governor. He's speaking to everybody with a radio in India on BBC. The name of the lecture was Western Civilization Must Be Crushed. For, don't be an idiot. You're being cheated. 
So that's our line. That's our tradition. Truth to power. Next. This is what people have been turned into. Can you see this little joke here? The guy's working in a factory. Zit, 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 zit. And he gets a, like a lunch break. You got two minutes to have a sandwich. And zit, zit. That's what people are being turned into. They're work units. When the Brits started thinking, hey, wait a minute. We can take this whole nation and turn her into consumer units. We can get them to buy our you know, Manchester cloth. We can get them to drink tea. We can get it, you know. Let's just turn them into work units that we can. Let's pick them up by their feet and shake them upside down till we get every penny out of their pockets and their gold fillings. And that's the, the ethos of the, wor the commercial world we live in now. There's no integrity. There's no quality of the work. There's no self-satisfaction in what you're doing. Just get a paycheck and get home as fast as you can and dull your senses so you can get up the next day and do it again. Is that culture? Is that human life? What Prabhupada said in the Bhagavatam is completely 100% prescient, seeing into the future. Next. See the little guy? You know, he's in rags, he's got nothing. The one thing he's got left is his lollipop, and here's, you know, Mr. Big Capitalist. He's squeezing that out of him. Can't even keep that. The 1% versus the 99%. It's the, as I said, the first generation in American history who will have a lower standard of life than their parents. The American dream, you have to be asleep to believe it. We're just work units to be exploited. Next. People work at will. The American dream was you worked for the same company. You were, you, were, you were a loyal, faithful, honest worker. And when you retired, you had a pension. You, 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 you retired at 65 with your house paid off. You had money to put your kids through college. And uh, you had a, a, often you had a little house by the lake or by the beach, you had a little, you know, a little vacation house, uh, maybe your wife had a maid, if you were lucky, but even that didn't, and then you had a pension, and pensions were like three-fourths or sometimes a hundred percent, and you live your golden years in peace. You know what people work for now? Top, you know, making $250,000 a year, $100,000 a year, corner office, you know what their contract is? At will. You know what an at will contract means? It means they can drop you down a shaft with no benefits. There's no pension. They, they talk to everybody, put your money into an IRA, manage your own money. You know, you don't want to trust us. And it just, it goes on and on and on. What's actually happening in the world? Next. So there is an alternative. I'm not going to leave you there, folks. You see this poor guy, you know, the, slumping home from his nondescript office in a cubicle, doing who knows what, stamping papers, you know, filling out, telling people and calling in for insurance, nope, denied, nope, denied. So he, you know, he's going home, he stopped to get a little, because nobody cooks anymore, it's too much work, and you know, so he's picked up some Chinese on the way home. He's going to go home and watch something on cable to dull his brain, have a whiskey so he can go to sleep. And wait a minute, you see the sign? The sign says scenic view. And there's a gap behind the buildings Wait, there's a whole other world out there. Wait a minute. I don't have to live in this world. The fact of the matter is there's a whole other way of life. We don't have to become work units squeezed by the 1%. Next. Prophet's purport nails it. On the other hand, that literature, which is, this is that alternative. This is that door that opens the window. Wait a minute. There's another way to live. On the other hand, that literature, which is full of descriptions of the transcendental glories of the name, form, pastimes, and of the unlimited Supreme Lord, is a transcendental creation meant to bring about a revolution in the impious life of misdirected civilization. Wait a minute. We're advancing in the wrong direction. Prabhupada says, seeing of water in a mirage is false. But what does it also confirm? Water exists somewhere. The fact that we want happiness, the fact that we want the unfettered freedom of the soul, as Prabhupada says, the fact that people are looking for, you know, one nation under God where there's unity and fraternity and liberty, as the French say, it's there because it's the natural desire of the self. But you've got a culture and a worldview that completely tweaks it. Next. This Bhagavata, this Bhagavad Purana is brilliant as the sun. 
Persons who have lost their vision to the dense darkness of ignorance and the age of Kali should get light out of this piranha. Here they all are, getting home from the fender bender factory and going to the bar and the, whatever it is. And here's Vyasadeva. Wait, wait, wait. Here's the alternative. Here's what you need to do. Here's where happiness is. Next. Is this all wishful thinking? Oh, you guys, it's just a pipe dream. You're just talking yourself into it. It's your typical cult thinking. That, oh, we're going to change the world, and oh, it doesn't have to be like this. Ah. You, you, you know, just lull yourself into a false sense of you're accomplishing something. But it's just wishful thinking. This is the way of the world, and you're just a sentimentalist. That's what they say. Next. But world views change. I don't have my laser pointer, but you see this with the edge of the world? And this one, is it, one guy's a little explorative, you know, a little adventurous. Wait a minute, there's got to be more. He's poking his head through, and there's a whole other dimension. World views change. Yeah, you probably, you know, you know there's, there's the age of faith. That's when they built the big cathedrals in Europe, and people had the, there's heaven above, hell below, and, and that's the world, of, and there's God, and that's it. That's called the world of faith. And it went on for about, the, the, the age of faith went on for about 300 years. That's what people believed. That was the, there were devils, there was hell, there was heaven. That's what they believed. What happened? Then you had the age of enlightenment. They start making scientific development, the age of the Renaissance. Wait a minute. You know, man is the measure of all things. We can figure out laws of physics, Einstein, uh, not Einstein, but Newton and, you know, gravity. We'll figure out the whole thing. And we'll break it down into tiny laws. We'll control material nature. We will make the world better by our own efforts. Forget God. You can do it by your own intellect. Well, they sailed right into the Industrial Age, and they sailed into World War I. They sailed into World War II. They went into the Industrial Age and just hellish. But my point, have you ever seen, you've got two buildings and another building in the middle. Have you ever seen those buildings, you know, the guy hits the uh, plunger and shh, the building collapses on itself, leaving the other two buildings completely together. You ever seen that? It happens. What they do is they get a structural engineer who knows the, the, the linchpins or the, the, you know, where the structure is resting. You blow out those points and the building collapses on its own weight. Just like you saw 9-11. They just blew out a floor and the thing just collapsed on its own weight. So, world views change. People believed in the age of faith. They believed in the age of enlightenment. They believed in the industrial age. All you have to do is blow out the linchpins. Those linchpins, Prabhupada said, is consciousness is just brain function there's no cell there's no soul there's no ghost in the machine it's just you know synapses firing it's chemical and electrical reactions there's no consciousness there's no soul there's no designer although all around us everywhere we look is designed not it all happened by random chance combination of the laws of physics there's no god there's no soul there's no design there's no purpose what's the purpose titillate your senses Live long and die well. And that's all there is to it. So, but those, we are, we have, Prophet said, my disease is I cannot think small. Here's the point I'm trying to make. We have a mission. And it's not an impossible mission. It's a mission that worked in the past. The principles are exactly the same. It works wherever they're applied. And what people are thinking now, the world views change. And they change by the distribution of transcendental knowledge. By giving them the Bhagavatam, by giving them Prashadam, and by them seeing devotees. Wait a minute. I was at a welfare office many, many years ago. I went with a devotee named Indra Bharta who'd gotten very sick in India, and we wanted to get a government, you know, Medi-Cal, for, you know, for, just so we could go to the doctor and get treated, right? It was in Detroit, you know, which is a depressing place just by nature. We're at the welfare office. Indra Parta, you know Indra? You? Indra Parta was his name. So he's there filling out. He was so sick, I went with him. And he's, it's all, it's painted that horrible industrial green. It's got the glass this thick that everything is squat. Yeah, number nine, number nine, you know. It's just hellish place to be, right? So he gets up there in line. He slips his form. You know, they got that little rotating thing. They got some woman who has, you know, just, she's been there 20 years and, you know, she's 
brain dead. They slip the thing. Actually, she wasn't, but they slip the thing underneath, and she reads the form. And you have to fill out the form. And they, what is your income? What is your bank balance? What, you, what is your house? I mean, they, do you have a boat? Do you have a burial plot? Gold fillings? Any change? You got, you got to stick a gum in your pocket? I mean, so they just ask everything they possibly can about you. And Indra Bart just, because he was a brahmachari. You go down the whole thing. The answer was zero, because you have to add the whole thing up. So this lady, she's looking at these forms, stamp, you know, and then he slips his thing. She looks at it. The only thing they look at is the bottom line. She'd never seen a zero before. Everybody's got some. And, and it was so blissful. She looked at the form. She looked at Indabarta. And Indabarta is a blissful devotee. have that natural effulgence of, you know, nasojate, nakanchate, free from anxiety, and, you know, just happy, you know. She, she, she took about a minute and a half. She was looking and... And she, she just, she couldn't contain it. She said, but you look so damn happy. She couldn't figure it out, you know. So the um, worldviews change. Next. We're getting close to the end. The time is ripe. You know, you've all heard the saying, the tipping point. Now here's a graph of the tipping point. The Sisyphus effect is when you're going up. If I'm rolling a big barrel, let's suppose, up a hill, what happens with a moment in attention? It rolls back. It'll roll right over me. Roll. This is Sisyphus. Sisyphus was rolled. It's a long story. From, uh, anyway. He was cursed to roll a rock to the top. If he didn't get to the top, if he pushed it over the top of the hill by sunset, he was freed from hell. But every time he got it just at the tip, he'd slip and it'd roll back down. He had to start over the next day. So that's Sisyphus from Greek mythology. So it's called the Sisyphus effect. Now the snowball effect. What happens if I take a little snowball and I roll it down a hill in theory? gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's no effort. It goes on its own momentum. So in the beginning, to change a world view, it is not easy. It's like the Sisyphus effect. You're trying to change people's minds. And I'll show you a, a point in just a minute. But once it gathers a certain mass, it just takes over. And it's happened again and again and again and again, and yet I say again, in human civilization, world views shift. People's values, people's goals, people's ethics, how they look out and what they see the world as, it changes. What we're doing is not impossible. Next. And here's some proof. I think of it's the good. Um, language, is an language is an indicator of the collective consciousness of a society or culture. For example, if I live in the desert, in Arabic, there's probably about 25 words to describe desert, if not more. There's all kinds of deserts. To us, it all looks the same. The, the Eskimos have, I, what is the number? I looked it up the other day. It's something like 34 different ways to describe ice. We just say, I, maybe Canada, Canada, they got a few, I don't know. <laughs> We've got slush, they've got slick, they've got all the, because that's what, if it's their experience, they need a word to express it. You follow me? If I'm experiencing it, that's how language develops. According to my experience, note the word Xerox was not a duplicate for copying, but once it was a Xerox machine, and oh, I got a Xerox it, it became synonymous with copying. It's a simple example how language develops. According to experience, language develops. Now let's look at what's happened to the English language. I think that's the next thing. There it is. Uh, all these words are concepts that have become common and accepted over recent years. The culture is changing right in front of our eyes. We used to go out on book distribution. You hand them a book, Perfection of Yoga. They'd hand it back, yogurt. I don't eat yogurt. Say, no, no, back, try it again. No, do you know? So many things. Karma, what does karma mean? The famous joke I like to tell, and I'll tell it again. A man is trying to explain, it could be a woman, tell it as you like, uh, a person was trying to tell his dimwit friend about the principle of transmigration, reincarnation, you know, like that. And he says, you know, if you live piously in your next life, you're born in a more elevated state. And the dimwit friend says, oh, like Colorado? But I'm telling you, that's what it was like. Mantra, nobody, mantra, meditation, 
Meditation was coming from the communists to rot the brains of the, of the young children. I mean, that, that was amazing. People did. So all these words, vegetarian. Now, when you say vegetarian, they say, well, what do you eat? Now you say you're vegetarian. People say, oh, you're not a vegan? You know, they, they, they say, oh, you know, oh, I, don't eat, I don't eat red meat anymore. They're apologetic. The culture is changing. Reincarnation. People accept, re so many people accept reincarnation. But mantra, guru, kirtan. Kirtan yoga. They teach kirtan yoga at yoga studios all over the world. The time is ripe. Remember that, that the, the tipping point. People are in a hellish condition. They're waking up that they're being exploited and cheating and life is, the philosopher Hobbes, life is beastly, brutish, and brief. And, that, and they're realizing it. And then they realize that there's an alternative, there's another way to live. So my point is, worldviews change, and that's our duty. The whole world is being cheated and being pushed in the wrong direction. And what is our mission? Change the world. Next. We only got a few more slides and we're done. You never know who will take a book. This is in Balboa Park. Nowadays, we would have sold them a set. <laughs> we weren't tuned into set distribution in those days. Next. This just happened to be to San Diego. This is your own Devavrata. This is our Bhakti Dimitri. Selling sets. Selling stacks of books. And people want them. You know the main reason people don't buy a set of books? What do you think? Nobody asked them. Nobody asked them. Oh, really? You tell them, how much you spend on, on, uh, at Starbucks? Add it up. All does is stress you out and waste your money and rot your teeth. Destroy, destroy your digestive system. Hey, hey, you can put on a credit card. I got a reader right here. Ching, ching. And the world changes. Sto stone, the Grand Canyon was created by water flowing. Drops of water wear away stone, and that's our mission, and it's working. Next. So I just, I have three verses from Chaitanya Charitamrita, which will be done. Distribute this Krishna consciousness movement. This is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his mood of an avatar, explaining what the mission is. To this, the, anyway. Distribute this Krishna consciousness movement all over the world. Let people eat this fruit and ultimately come free from old age and death. Next. All the, world, all the wealth in the three worlds cannot equal the value of one such nectarian fruit of devotional service. That's what they're looking for. Next. It is the duty of every living being to perform welfare activity for the benefit of others with his life, words, uh, life, wealth, intelligence, and words. Next. So this is the last slide. Actually, there's one more. Maruvis Prabhu asked Prabhupada, because in, the, in Bhagavad Gita it says, for one who's performed pious activities and whose reaction to sinful activities are eradicated, they can take to devotional service. So I have no more pop, I have no more debt of sinful activities. And I've got a big stock of pious activities, pop and punya. And when there's no pop and sufficient punya, I can get the opportunity to take to devotional service. Madhuvisa said, but Prabhupada, I was performing sinful activities till the day I met you. I walked out of McDonald's yesterday and I met the devotees. So how is it possible that I've been able to take the devotional service? Prabhupada's answer was, I have created your good fortune. I've created your good fortune. All I ask is that you go and create good fortune for others. The simple fact is, we have been delivered. We've received the greatest gift. And if you receive a gift from somebody, anyone who's got any kind of heart or human sentiment, you feel indebted. Don't you feel indebted? Somebody gives you something, a doctor cures you of a disease, or somebody pays off all your, your credit card bill. What do you think? Jeez, thank you. You feel a sense of indebted. Let me do something for you. Prophet said, all I ask. And he did ask something. Please note, he did ask for something. All I ask is you go out and give good fortune to others. So this whole material machine that is just devouring the living entities into the darkness of Kali Yuga, we can stop it, we are stopping it, and we're doing it by book distribution. Okay? We can end there because we are over time.
Thanks a lot, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. It works. It is not sentiment. It is not sentiment. It is not wishful thinking. It is not hoping against hope. It's happening before our very eyes. Hare Thank you, Maharaj. When you were thinking, when you were speaking about the words, how they change, and people understand. Surah tells one that he was in the 